Hello, I'm Michael Littlecrow, and I have this presentation for you on tools for the development of human potential within Native American communities, but actually these are appropriate tools for all communities. Uh, so beginning, I'd like to just introduce a little bit about the community I come from and the places I've worked. So I am Turtle Mountain Chippewa from North Dakota. Uh, we call ourselves in our own language, the Anishinaabe, which means original people. I worked with the Little Priest Tribal College in Nebraska, doing some professional development, as well as the Signa Chippewa Tribal College in Michigan. Uh, I've worked with the Paskiyaki, the Salt River, and the Gila River Indian communities in Arizona, as I have been working for Scottsdale Community College as a residential faculty since 2004. In 2018, I moved my full-time appointment over to Arizona State University as a lecturer uh, so that I could also work on a doctorate in Indigenous education. I've been teaching as an adjunct now back at Scottsdale Community College and at South Mountain Community College uh, for a few terms now, I guess semesters. Uh, as you might tell, I'm from Oregon, where we have uh, quarters rather than semesters. Anyway, let's go ahead and get started on our journey of exploring ways that we can integrate culture into the way we teach. Teaching from the inside out, to me, that's what it means to be an Indigenous scholar, to come from where you are, to find your students where they are, and together walk hand in hand in a journey of exploration. So I'd like to introduce first my uh, organization, <laughs> two people, uh, a nonprofit, Open Global Village, Original People's Education Network. Uh, I'm an indigenous math educator, uh, both at ASU and the Maricopa Community College District. And our co-president is Ula Panyawan Pintang, who's a graduate scholar at Arizona State University and her focus is on mindful education to help teachers reduce stress, students reduce stress, and to find a way of educating people that is pleasant, um, reducing that stress and increasing success. So first of all, let's talk about, um, it's a little hot in here. Let me take this off. Let's talk about the real problem in our American math education. And, and we only get this by not looking at all the data together, but by disaggregating the data. So looking at different pieces of the data. And this comes from one of my uh, mentors who I've never met, but I have been a follower of his work for uh, since my graduate days uh, back at Oregon State University in 1998. Uh, Dr. Uri Treisman is a professor from the University of Texas at, Texas at Austin. Uh, and in his talk, um, you know, we talk about the U.S. Um, being at the very bottom of the um, uh, 25 or 30 OECD countries. So you see Finland ranks at the top in their math performance, a lot of European countries, uh, and you see America way down there at the bottom. That's when the data is all taken together. But let's disaggregate. Let's look at what happens in the U.S., when you break it down by economics. So what you start to see here, and this is what he was able to do, is break down by the percent, the, the, each school area, zip code area, the percent of free lunches that are in that area. So when you are in an area here at the top, the United States, where you're getting zero to only 10% free lunch, so you're in a, an affluent area, Notice the U.S. scores rank at the top of the world. We, we surpass Finland. We surpass Switzerland. Um, and if you look at just the areas that have 10 to 25 percent of their students getting free lunch, we're still pretty much up there above Germany, Poland, and some of these other uh, countries. But when you get to the area, the areas in the U.S. where 50 to 75 percent are getting free lunch or 75 to 100 percent of the students are getting free lunch the economically depressed areas math 
also goes down. Math learning is lower. So it's not that we don't know how to teach math. It's not that we don't know how to be successful in what we do. It's an economic issue. It's a systemic economic issue. We need to put our best teachers where they can make the most progress. But it's not just a teacher problem, okay? There's a lot of good teachers working with these students at the 75 to 100% uh, free lunch area. But there's systemic things that are causing it. And it's not just all the schools. There's a lot of issues to address, but if we address those, why can't the whole US be up here at the top? There is no reason for that. So we, when we see it as a systemic economic issue, that's when we begin to solve it. So I turn now to the king of human development. Kofi Annan uh, defined, he was secretary general of the UN. Um, I've, I'm aware of him because he served for most of my life that I'm aware of. Uh, there is a new secretary general now, but he, he defines uh, that all people can be empowered through education, through opportunity, and through health care uh, to live healthy, knowledgeable, and creative lives. That's human development. So as teachers, we are certainly in part of the education part of it, but we are also part of making more opportunities for our students. And we are a portion of that health care part by uh, getting out information. So we can address and have power in all three areas of human development. Another great mentor of mine that I, uh, I sort of met once, I saw him drive by when we uh, were on the roadside waiting for him. King Bumavan Adiyade uh, was in May 2006 given the United Nations first ever uh, Human Development Lifetime Achievement Award for his work in Thailand, how he went to the poorest of the poor, he visited all his people, and he made opportunity for all his people through education. As the world's development king, your majesty, majesty has reached out to the poorest and the most vulnerable people of Thailand, regardless of their status, ethnicity, or religion, listened to their problems, and empowered them to take their lives in their own hands. So these were the words of Kofi Annan to His Majesty. Could those not be the same words that we listen to, giving education and opportunity to the people in our community, to those children, the most vulnerable in our society? So there's a need for a different paradigm, especially when we're working in economically depressed communities. We need to think differently about education and how we motivate students to achieve. King Bumavan had a concept with these four stages of the learner-centered education. It starts with determination, but a determination with faith, with faith and hope that there is opportunity ahead. That's how we have to get our students started seeking knowledge with morality. So bringing in not just policy and rules into education, but a moral code, not following rules, but following the heart, which involves intention as well as action. We'll get into that a little bit more. Then using the knowledge we obtain wisely for the advancement of society, keeping abreast of the changes in our world, in our, our profession, and then returning back again, to beginning anew with determination and faith. So seeking knowledge with morality. Uh, for teachers, this is where we have a very important aspect that we can engage in, both academic and moral knowledge. To make learning complete, we use acquired knowledge from others, which hopefully as teachers, that's what we're trying to give to the students. But we're not just using a banking, a depositing information into their minds, but we're using the knowledge we've acquired and sharing it. Then what has to happen is the students have to take the time contemplating what is going on here, what am I learning? And 
than practicing to achieve results. And again, the students are not the only learners in this endeavor, in this process. We ourselves as teachers are also learners and the students become our teachers as we respond with this give and take, learning with impartiality. Impartiality to their economic status, their racial, their ethnic backgrounds, their religious backgrounds, impartially teaching all students with equity and success in mind. So we learn to link all our learning to all disciplines. So a, a, a complex way of learning that is not just siloed into various disciplines, but that things are connected. So here's some um, research on brain that gives clues to some of the difficulties we face in math education. So the amygdala is a portion of the brain. Let me go back, I thought it highlighted. You might see it there towards the bottom, the amygdala. Um, and the research has shown that uh, when you first take in a math word problem, students process goes through the amygdala in the brain, which is the emotional center. And if they're experiencing stress, which often happens when doing math, teaching math, there's more activity in this amygdala than in the prefrontal cortex, as we'll see where uh, we could process things. And things, even minor things, such as a teacher's frowning face, can cause this stress and this anxiety to build and block the student's thinking. So smile, smile as a teacher. The stress reaction may hit hardest the students who might otherwise be the most enthusiastic about math. So some of our students who are not learning math or hating math, they had the opportunity to be the ones who were excelling because they were excited about math but they didn't get that opportunity to love it. They were blocked by some reason. They were blocked by stress. They were blocked by a frowning teacher's face, something like that. So if we can reach the two students who are struggling hard in math, they may turn themselves around to be one of the most enthusiastic and most productive in math. And some of the uh, more insights can come from brain research, looking at the right brain functions. Um, you look up here, let's see, sorry about that. Um, there is, let's see, where's the math part of the brain? Is uh, mental math, there it is. Under spatial sense, you'll see mental math, uh, body awareness. Uh, so there's these sorts of senses and the body senses from the left side will be right up here in this region that would also get mental math. We look at the left side of the brain, um, where's the portion? Here's body senses over here and you'll look that that's also the processing area for math symbols, body senses and math symbols. So when we use our hands and how many of us use our hands for doing math? Many of us maybe, um, I know I do, and some of my colleagues will say that that's a bad thing and they'll tell me to do it. So I, I stick it under the table and just keep doing it because I've realized that by using my fingers, I'm using my body senses and that's connecting me with the area of the brain that does the math. Okay, so different ways of using the hand. So think about how you count. Um, if we were here all in the classroom together, I would have you show it, but Instead, I'll show you some responses. Some people count maybe using the thumb to go up and they count this way. Notice uh, people from tribe B, different culture, they use an open hand and they count down to five. So this is five for them. For tribe A, that is five. Can you see the cultural difference here? Do you want five or do you want five? Which one is which? Nothing or five? It's hard to tell. C is an interesting way. I see this sometimes in students. It's sort of a way that once you count, it comes back up. And so it's sort of a positional system. So five would just be the thumbs down. I could go like this. And this is actually five because of uh, the fifth fingers down. If I work in that way. And then D is actually the system I use, uh, a thumb to hold things down. And 
here's my five. So different ways of counting. And from this cultural aspect, there is actually more than uh, one way to count. There's more than just getting to 10 with two hands. Uh, there was a way of, of counting using the, uh, I don't know what you call these, these little indentations in the finger. So each has three. So we could actually count to, if we use the thumb to, as, as uh, markers as well, we could get to 14. Now, some people will say they've got three on their thumb too. Some will say there's two. But this method was based on doing that. You had 14 and 14, which gave you 28. And the, the beauty of this system is that it ties in with the lunar calendar. There are 28 days in a lunar month from full moon to full moon, uh, 28 days. So on your hand, you could actually keep a calendar, you know, tie your finger, tie, tie a ribbon around your finger to remember something, actually remembering a date. Another system using the back of the hand and the knuckles, you get, as you can see here, up to 19. One more would be 20. So many base 20 systems were based on the knuckles on the back of the hand, counting those. Again, using the hand to do math. In the islands, uh, where there was nice soft sand to walk on, many cultures did not wear shoes, and so they had access to their toes. And the names they gave to the fingers and the toes matched up with the names they gave to the numbers one through 20. Each toe had a specific number name as well. Um, so you can see hands, fingers, and toes going to 20, a base 20 system, which is a different type of mathematics than a base 10 system. And we're gonna see um, how these different systems have gotten embedded into language, which can make difficulties for students who speak a language other than a base 10 language, which you're gonna see includes us English speakers and Spanish speakers. So from Babylon, they had another way of counting. They used the thumb as a tool to count and they counted these segments and they got 12. So you see this a lot in the American system, the British system, uh, where we have a dozen roses, a dozen donuts. A dozen is so important in our culture and it comes from the way the counting was done. Another important thing is think about time. Have you ever thought why there's 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour? 60 seems somewhat arbitrary, but it's not. It's based on the hand because what they did with the one hand is counting to 12. What did they do with the other hand? Well, they didn't count to another 12, which would only get them to 24. They counted how many 12s they had which got them five twelves is 60. So they had a, a, a base 60 system, but it included a base five and a base 12 at the same time. So it was a very vibrant way of doing mathematics. If you do, uh, geometry often involves this because we're gonna do angles. That's what the Babylonians were famous for is their angles, their trigonometry. Um, you'll see this base 60 embedded there. And you'll see it embedded in the English language, which has 12 sort of as our base number. And we'll, we'll discuss that. Different mathematics uh, from a different culture. So let's talk about language. Uh, one thing I will look at is an is a Asian language. We're going to look at math really comes from the Asian continent. So the modern math we do today. And one I'm familiar with is a Thai language. And here's the numbers for one through 10. Mung Sang Sang Si. Ha, ho, jet, bat, gao, sip. And I apologize, my, uh, my accent's very terrible. There's, there's a, Thai is a tonal language and I, I'm pretty sure I messed up the, the, the tones as I usually do. But what I wanna point out is when you get to 10, the next one, you see that this is a, a base 10 because as we get to 11, it's sip at, the word for 10, and they change the word for one just to make it a little easier. Sip at, literally one more than 10. 12 is sip song. You can see that is 10 with two more. Sip song, 10 with three more. And then when you get to groupings of 10, ye sip, som sip for 30, si sip for 40, you see that now the, the counting word, the, the, so som sip, let's look at 30, comes first and then the 10. So three tens, som sip, three tens. Uh, we're going to see that the English language doesn't do that. But this is a perfectly organized base 10 language. 
And then when they get to 100, they have a separate word for hundreds. It's uh, as we do in English as well, uh, Loy. A thousand is a pun. And 10,000, what we say is 10,000, they, they have a word for it. They call it a moon. So it would be one moon. And so you can see the part, all these different powers of 10, they have special words. It is really literally a base 10 language. And I see this in uh, Asian languages. Japanese, they uh, students have reported to me, this to me, um, Chinese um, and the various languages in India have this incorporated. What about English? When we get to 10, it's 10. Well, what is 11? Is 11, 10, and one more? No. Or is it one and 10 and 10 and one? No, it's 11, some separate word. 12 is some separate word. But then notice, because we're a base 12 afterwards, because of the, the way language does adapt, 13 becomes a base 10 language. It's got the sort of the prefix for three, third, and teen has been how the 10 has been changed a little bit. So 13 is three tens, 14 is four tens. Actually, it should be backwards. It should be switched around, but it isn't. Uh, so there is difficulty you can see for English speakers, especially initially learning it, 13 and 30 are very similar. It's got that, that three at the beginning, but one is 10 with three more. So it should be teen three or something. Uh, and then the other one is 310, so 30 makes sense. But uh, we have this dyslexic language that we're working with when we talk about numbers. This is a difficulty, especially in early learners. Should we change our number sh our, our language system? I say yes, but um, I don't think I have much support for that. So until we do, let's change the way we teach by addressing that issue. Um, so there, there's, yeah unique names for 11 and 12, three through 19 are units names, but they're reversed uh, and it should. How about Spanish? Well, one thing you might, uh, those who are from the Spanish culture, uh, you you know of the quinceañera. Uh, when a, a girl turns 15, she becomes a woman. And what you see in the Spanish language is that 15 is culturally significant because it's, it's there in the language. Notice your words for 11, 12, you know, instead of 10, 11, 10, 12, uh, they've got their separate words. But when you get to 16, look at, you've got the word for 10 with 6, 10, 6, 10 with 6, 10, 7. And again, I apologize for my accent. Uh, it's not good. Uh, but you can see that the Spanish language has a base of 15 somehow that has culturally been established in cultural practices and is also there in the language, making it different, difficult for Spanish learners, uh, Spanish speaking learners of math to get onto a system that is base 10, a system that came from Asia. But for our native speakers, our indigenous speakers here in the Pascayaki language, this is, I love this language, uh, the, the mathematical language of it. Uh, because it, you can see so much. So you see uh, 10 is uh, Wahamani and 11 Wahamani Anasuna, which uh, you see a connection between one, uh, 10 with one more. You see a good base 10 in here. However, it also has a base 20, and there's also a base 8 in here because 8, the word for 8 is Wakanaki. Nike. Uh, again, I apologize for those who do speak the Aki language. Um, it's two fours, uh, two times four, which is eight. So it's got a, this embedded base eight in there as well, which the Yaki did travel up into California for a time and, and live with the uh, Chumash people. The Chumash people had a, a mathematics that was base eight. So you see the vibrancy of the Yaki people through their language. They also, when you get to 20, 20 is something new. It's a sim It's one taka. Uh, so in their language, 20 is a base, and you see 40 is two 20s, oi taka. Um, and the 60 is three 20s. You see a base 20 in here, which gives credence to the mathematics of the Mayans, the Aztecs, because the Yaqui came from those parts of Mexico up into the U.S., up over to California. And you, I, I've seen their cultural, historical travels, and in their language, I see the mathematics changing as they went to different peoples. Very vibrant, resilient people. 
my own language, uh, from my own people, the Algonquin language of the Chippewa. Uh, we see base 10, uh, Madaswi, and 11, Madasi Ashwa Beji, literally 10 with one more. It's a base 10 language. Although it does also have sort of a base five in there as you explore it, it's just interesting to see this connection between language and mathematics. It embeds hundreds, if not thousands of years of history into a people's culture and their way of doing math. So where did modern math come from, the math we use today? Well, the symbols that we write for mathematics, uh, they can directly be traced back to what's listed here as the Gupta Empire, uh, India. And as you see at this time, this is 475 AD, at this time, it really is the central place of the known world, as far as the history is, of course, known to the Europeans, probably. Uh, there was a vibrant culture over here in the Americas as well, just as vibrant. But what we'll do is we'll say for the, the modern historians um, who take a European centristic look at things, really, we have to go back and say it wasn't Europe that was the center, it was India. And India becomes this uh, uh, Hindu culture, Hindu mathematics, three, 5,000 years ago. And there was stuff before that, I'm sure. Um, I know. But three to 5,000 years ago, we've got their mathematics. And I'm going to share some of their mathematics with you today, and you'll see how mentally uh, it helps in doing mathematics. It's called a system of uh, the Vedic mathematics because uh, they were rediscovered around the turn of this century, uh, actually, I guess, turn of which century? Around the 1900s, 1911 uh, ish to be exact, uh, by someone who studied the Vedas, ancient texts. And from these Vedas, he took poetry, these uh, sutras, that allowed a way of remembering how to do math. And it gives a way that's 10 to 15 times faster allows for mental agility. It's a complete system. It gets the brain's right and left hemispheres to work together, uh, improves memory, and most importantly, or as important as anything else, builds a, uh, an interest in numbers and doing mathematics, reducing the fear of math. So it was a whole culture of learning. Uh, so this is um, from 500 BCE, uh, before the Common Era, like the crest of the peacock, like the gem on the head of a snake, so is mathematics at the head of all knowledge. So let's look at how culture of learning was involved here. First of all, uh, learning with morality. We tied that back to what King Bhumavan was talking about. And to learn with morality, to go by a moral code rather than a policy code, rather than having a bunch of rules to follow, what moral code do we need to follow? Well, we have to first realize that we are the owner of our actions. Any actions we make, whether they're verbal actions, whether they're physical actions, whether they're mental actions, we own them. We are the ones who initiated them. There are two types of actions we can initiate, skillful actions, unskillful actions. How do we define the difference? You probably are aware learners can figure this out. Skillful actions kind of, we improve our lot in life, make us happy, not sad. Unskillful actions initially make us sad or, or eventually make us sad and do not move us forward in life. I'd like to add to this the fact that anything that would harm another or ourself, we will classify as unskillful action because everybody wants happiness for themselves. So when we injure another, they will injure us. And this will perpetuate in a circle of unskillfulness. So first of all, we want, uh, from a moral perspective, we want to be skillful in our classroom activities. That helps us. We want to develop those skillful when we notice something. Ah, oh, this worked for me. This way of studying worked for me. Develop it. Do it more often. When you find something that is unskillful, you know, I'm, I'm trying to study and watch TV at the same time, and I just can't concentrate. Abandon that method. Maybe turn off the TV. Maybe turn on some music. They've shown that certain types of music can be helpful for study. Maybe turn off the music. 
we have to decide each thing is different. But unskillful things, don't punish ourselves. Simply work to walk away, abandon those things, and we will make progress. Develop the skillful, abandon the unskillful. So one of the activities that can help us is realizing these three interconnection act actions. So we have mindfulness, we have alertness, which is the ability to concentrate. Mindfulness is the memory part. And ardency is that, uh, that heartfelt desire to do something. So mindfulness, we keep something in mind. That's our memory. In mathematics, there's a lot of things we have to keep in mind to do successfully to do mathematics successfully. Uh, active attention. We are focusing on something. We are alert. And our ardency, that's our intense feeling and hopefully a pleasurable feeling. That's what we want because then that helps us keep the thing in mind and we keep this circle going. So there is a process for building the skillful concentration. Uh, it's called directed thought evaluation. Directed thought and evaluation. So we direct our thoughts onto something. We evaluate whether we're sticking with that thought and making progress, is it being skillful? And when we that evaluation says, yes, we're getting skillful at directing our thoughts to an item, we get joy, we get joy out of that. And so then we wanna redirect our thoughts on that. In mathematics, that's certainly something we need to do. We need to direct our thoughts to the work we're working on, the problem we're solving. We need to have this evaluation part where we evaluate and, and the steps I'm making, is it getting me closer or further away from a solution? And to get that joyful feeling when we're able to evaluate and see us getting closer to a solution. But there's also a physical activity we can do. And I'm gonna take you through this for just a moment on uh, what we can do. We can build concentration simply by something we all have, which is breath. Watching the breath. We direct our thought. This is our first step. Direct your thought to just watch the breath. Evaluate the breath. Okay, so directed thought. I'm breathing in. I'm breathing out. That's directed thought. The evaluation part is you think, was that a good breath? Was it too deep? Was it not deep enough? Was it comfortable? And all we're going to do is look at our breath for a little bit, in and out and evaluate whether the breath feels comfortable or not. And hopefully make adjustments until our breath does feel comfortable. And then we're just going to feel that joy. We will keep watching the breath because if we stop watching the breath and we start watching the joy, it goes away. But this will help us build concentration. So the joy is when the breath is special. So here for just a moment, join me please. I like to close my eyes if you want to, that, that will be helpful. We're gonna just watch the breath, evaluate the breath, and feel some joy. I'm breathing in, breathing out. Breathing in, breathing out. I'm watching the breath as it comes in, as it goes out. I'm focusing on the nostril area. Not going deep inside, but just the breath as it comes into the nostril and the breath as it goes out from the nostril. In, out. Breathe in deep. Breathe out fast. Breathe in shallow, breathe out long. Mix it up until it feels comfortable, until you find that right rhythm for you of your breath coming in and going out. Coming in and going out. If you haven't already, please slowly open your eyes. Give kindness to yourself. Think of those students you will be serving. Send them the kindness that you feel right now. This sort of centered place of peace. 
That's where it all begins. It's inside ourselves. We need that peace inside to be able to share it with others. So there's an activity you can do on a regular basis. Get yourself centered one or two minutes. It'll do it. Practicing for longer, I try um, in the evenings, 10, 15, 20 minutes, an hour is good. Watching the breath. And I just bring out the breath. It's not a Buddhist breath. It is not a Christian breath. It's not a Muslim breath. It's not a racial breath. or any, It's a human breath. This is not about religion. It's not about some cultural aspect. It's just about something that all us humans have in common. The ability to breathe and the need to breathe comfortably. When we do, we can. We can bring that peace from within out into the world we see. Okay, so now let's apply the same technique that of watching the breath, directed thought and evaluation to something more mathematical like numbers. But this time, let's take the culture of India where the modern mathematics was developed with the 10 numbers rather than a base 12 or or 20 or 60. Uh, those are all perfectly good bases. The Mayans and Aztecs had a base 20 system, very powerful way to count, and we will explore some of those. But the base number system of 10 from India in the way it was done in India mentally, we're gonna empower ourselves by taking directed thought and evaluation and using it to actually subtract numbers in a very powerful way, and even multiply numbers. So the first sutra, uh, there was 16 of them that were found to be very helpful and basically could explain all the mathematics. Uh, this one's actually labeled as number five, but uh, by one more than before, by one more than the one before, is the translation from the, uh, uh, I believe it's Hindi, but it's, uh, uh, yes, uh, the, the, the Hindi is below it, okay, by one more than one before. So what we do is we start off with that we're going to have 10 numbers, so here's, and we're going to put our numbers into a circle. So uh, with our circle of 10, we have to start someplace, so we choose a place and put a 1. Then by one more than before, we go ahead and start counting. So one more than 1 is 2, so we put in our 2, 3, one more than before, one more than before, and we fill in our circle of 10 all the way around here, and there's our circle of 10. Now, the next activity that I do uh, for this particular one, I'm gonna we'll walk through it, but is to look at this number, the circle of 10, and look for patterns that you can see as the numbers are arranged here. Some people will see certain diagonals that all add to the same thing or, or subtract or, uh, they'll see different patterns. Some students have pointed out uh, triangular patterns, groups of three numbers that sort of all match up. What I'm going to direct your thought to is numbers that add to 10. So if you look on at the 10 as sort of the primary thing we're focusing on, if you look to the left and the right, what do you see? You see that 9 plus 1 is 10. And then you look Next one down, look to the left and the right. Eight plus two is 10. Keep on going, seven plus three is 10. Six plus four is 10. So these are what we're gonna call complements of each other. Six complements four, four complements six. They make a complete of 10. And then we have our last one, which is a unique number because it is its own complement. Five plus five is 10. Uh, and so notice how 10 starts because it needs two digits to re represent it. It needs the one and the zero. Every other number is a single digit number, but there are just those nine digits, one through nine. And if we throw in ten, a zero, there's that 10th that, uh, one. Um, but as far as counting, we're... Uh, we just have these nine. And so kind of take a mental picture of this. We're gonna see how this will actually empower us to do multiplication uh, 
because it'll help us do subtraction. Okay. The other thing we need to keep in mind is the circle of nine. So similar, but this time I'm going to ask you, since we're in a circle, we could go left as easily as we go right. In some cultures, that's the way to go. They, some go what they call sunwise, clockwise. Some go counterclockwise or anti-sunwise, uh, just depending upon the particular culture. I had uh, two uh, elders that I was uh, friends with. One was Lakota and one was Nez Perce. Uh, and they met each other at a gathering because the Nez Perce go anti-clockwise and the Lakota always go clockwise. And so when they were going through the circle of greeting, they met each other. And they said later on in the relationship, they were fast friends for many years, that had they not been, had they been of the same culture, they may never have met because they would have been both going in a circle one fast ahead of the other, always never meeting. But because their cultures were different, they met and became friends. This, these are the lessons we can learn from mathematics. So let's do this. Uh, and people who, like me, are dyslexic. We see things backwards and forwards, sometimes more backwards than forwards. But this type of mathematics where we can go either way will be a great help for people who struggle with a linear look that the European mathematics has brought. So we put in our one. This time we're going to put our two anti-clockwise. Okay, so we're going to go two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So the circle of nine, we went the other way. We could have easily gone the other way, but what we're looking for is ways to uh, sort of uh, shake us up a bit and help us to see numbers in a new light. So again, focus on the nine. And what we're going to do is either side of the nine, what do you start to see now? You see the eight and one is nine. The seven and two is nine. The six and three are nine. And the five and four are nine. There's one more pair of complements here of single digit complements that is not as evident, but it's this one, nine and zero. Okay, so these are the complements we want to keep in mind. So we do mathematics from this perspective, that this is the part, this is our mindfulness part. We want to keep these complements in our memory, pulling them up right away. Just like if you have a good friend who become coupled, you know, that there's, they're always going together. I, I had a good friend in, um, in uh, college, and we were both named Mike, so they called us the Mikes. Uh, and they saw one of us, they asked where the other Mike was, right? So Mike and Mike, that, that's kind of one way. You, you do it with uh, couples when you get together, uh, male and female, whatever, male and male, female and female. But when you see two people that are attached at the hip all the time, uh, as a, you know, Joe and Sally, where you see Joe, you think of Sally. You see Sally, you think of Joe. These are things that we do, uh, family members. You, you see one member and you think of their rest of the family. That's the kind of natural memory we can use in mathematics now by remembering these. Okay, I'm going to show you a simple activity uh, to do multiplication. So we're going to do this. Uh, now you'll see the fingers eight times seven. So where I'm getting the eight, if you put down two fingers, right? Uh, sorry. Yeah, two fingers are down. There's five, six, seven, eight. There's eight. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to represent, because I want to be able to do two numbers with, with, one, uh, with two hands, so one number with each hand. So I want to look at this eight as being two away. I want to use the complement. Two away from 10 is what eight is. Okay, so I'm looking at the down fingers. It's a complement. What complements two? Eight. Okay, so that's the way I look at it. For the seven, what complements seven? Three, so three fingers go down. So seven is three away from 10. And again, this is a, it's not a test on any of this, but watch how this works. When I take eight times seven, I'm going to count these up fingers as each as 10, and I add them together. One, two, three, four, five, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. That's 50, 50 standing up. 
the down fingers, the ones that are down, I'm going to knock them together to remind me that these I add, these I multiply. So I've got 50, two times three is six. I've got 56, eight times seven is in fact 56. So con comp uh, concentrate on the complements. There they are, two and three. Add the up fingers, three plus two, 30 plus 20, 50. And we put them together, we've got 56. Okay, now I might say, okay, that was cool, but does it only work with eight times seven? Well, you would, uh, why would I be bringing it up if it only worked with eight times seven? So we've got this one. Again, this is my uh, uh, reason I didn't go into art school, uh, my hieroglyphics here. So we've got eight. Remember, eight is with two fingers down. Try to keep them all up. And six is going to be four away, so it's going to be four fingers down. So watch this. We've got 40. Two times four is eight. Forty-eight. And I'll uh, show you this one. There's your 40. Two times four is eight. 48. It works with nine times six. It works in these groups of five because when we're using one hand to represent these, that's what we do. So in the way of doing math from India, the memor strict memorization was just one through multiplying one through five, up to five times five. Five times five is 25. You do need to build up that memory. And with that, you're able to get the rest. In, and I'll, I'll show you here. So nine times six, we'll just kind of flip through this, um, you know, draw our pictures, get our answers. Seven times six actually ends up getting, being most the, the hardest one, and, and most students will give it a try. So six is uh, four down, seven is three down, and people said, no, that's only 30. Uh, and, I, and they know that sometimes six is 42. So they say, hey, little crow, your method fell apart. And I said, well, first of all, it's not my method. I wish it was, I, but I found it. I did not invent it. But wait, if it carry through, 3 times 4 is 12. So you get 12 plus 30. There's your 42. So, And it also illustrates that when we have to carry a number over, that that task requires greater mental thought process exercise. It wears us out a little bit. So... We get to see these areas of mathematics that cause a little bit of uh, cognitive dis discord. And if you're a psychology major, which since you're education majors, I'm sure you have, you'll know what that means better than I did. So uh, now watch this cool thing about this is that this process also works for 12 and 13, numbers above 10. And this is where the real power comes in because most of us have not memorized those multiplication tables above 10. And now we were, when I was young, we were supposed to memorize up to 12 times 12. I barely got to 10 by 10 myself. So um, just say it, okay? So 12 times 13, but this time the rules are a little different. For 12, what we're gonna represent is the surplus above 10. So it just has the down fingers represented the sort of the amount that we were missing, this time they're gonna be the surplus, the amount over 10. So 12 is two down and 13 is three down. And now this one is gonna be different uh, because it's above 10 and that's what happens is we are going to actually ignore the up fingers for this process. What we're gonna do is we're going to add the down fingers. So I do like this kind of like Spider-Man pose, figure out that's 50, right? Those, we count them as 10 and we add them together, it's 50. And then we multiply them, 50, six. And then we also remember that 10 times 10 is 100. 156, 12 times 13. So 12, two is about 10. So here's the, the, uh, the details, three fingers down, okay? And then what we do with it, we add the down fingers, 20 and 30 is 50. We multiply the down fingers, three times two is six. So there's our 56 and remembering that 10 times 10 is 100. So we, we do have to remember a few things, but 156, try it with 12 times 13. And it works all the way up to 15. 
And now there's another process if you want to remember above 15, but then you have to remember that 15 times 15 is 225, and it's a little bit harder to add. And so, uh, but it can be done, and, and people have done it. And then that way, you're always, when you have access to your hands, you have access to it. Now, I realize there's some people who've had uh, accidents, disabilities, um, but what I want you to see is that from the brain science aspect, using our hands in a particular way to do math is not just giving us a physical representation of answers like it is here, but it is, but right up in here, the mental, the cognitive process, it's aiding the brain to think in the right area of the brain. Probably, again, for, uh, uh, again, this is just going out there on the ledge on from evolutionary purposes, there's this connection between how we used our hands culturally and how we did our math. It goes way back before we even know. And um, so just a nice little trick. Uh, 12 times 14, two down for 12, four down for 14. Look at the two fingers. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna add them. So that's 160 and then multiply them. Two times four is eight, 168. 12 times 14 is 168. If you wanna break out your calculator, you're welcome to do it. If you wanna do it with long um, multiplication, you're welcome to do it, but that is the answer. And once you get this process down, you carry it with you. You don't have to memorize. You just do under the table these uh, little hand sign things and you get it, okay? Again, a few more examples of using this process of two numbers. And again, 13 times 14 is actually one of the harder ones uh, because you have the carry. Okay, if you have three down and four down and you add them together, you get 70. But then when you take three times four, you get your 12. So that gives you 80, 82 plus the 100, which is 10 times 10. Okay, whoa. That's a scary picture, right? How many fingers do we have? So how high can we go? Well, in India, again, we just have the, the 10 fingers. Um, so there is a way we can proceed with higher numbers though, even if we don't have a hand like this. And, and I'm glad I, I don't, okay. Finding the complement of a number all from nine to last from 10. So what we do in this one, is as we look at numbers, we can find its complement. Okay, so we did this with numbers between up to 10, like eight and two are complements, right? Eight, two, they give you 10. But what we're looking for now is complements to uh, get to 100 or to get to what we call a base number. So a thousand would be a base number because it's a one with all zeros behind it. 10,000 is a base number, one with all zeros behind it. So as we look at this, um, 87 to make its complement, we do all from nine to last from 10. And when we're talking about complements, so I look at the complement of eight is one and the complement of seven is three. And now I complemented eight to nine and I complemented seven to 10. So all from nine to last to 10. And then when you add them together, you get your hundred. Let's take a look at another one. So 903, the complement of nine is zero. Complement of zero is nine. Now remember, I'm complementing those to nine because as the sutra says, all the complement everything to nine, but the last digit complement to, to 10. So three complements to seven, not, not to uh, six. That's why I'm trying to make tens. And now watch when you add that together, you get 1,000. You get a base number, seven and three are 10 carry the one, because then you keep carrying that one, right? Let's look at another one. Here we go, 364, and you complement all those numbers to nine. The last non-zero gets complemented to 10. Now, some people will go all the way and they'll wait till zero, but remember, zero doesn't factor into the complements of 10. It only factors into the complements of nine. So if, if your number has a, a zero at the end, uh, we actually figure that the number has ended sooner. So if that makes sense. So we make the last number two. 
the last non-zero number is two, then you go to eight. And the cool part about learning all this, I, I, there are these books on Vedic math, is you, you get to anticipate this by going through the activities and you say, you know, first you try to follow the rules exactly, like in rule following, but there's a few exceptions here and there. So then you get to follow the, follow the morality or the intention of the process. And again, you try to go ahead and add everything together and you get this uh, one million, okay? Making complements of numbers. So there's this whole process in Vedic math. Uh, I put together workshops. There are workshops in um, India, of course, and in other parts of the world uh, where over several days, students can learn these techniques, practice these techniques and make them their own and then apply them in their learning. So now let's apply this with, uh, let's, let's mesh this up with our hand technique of where we took the complements um, and we added the, the leftovers and then this, it's, it's perfectly lined up here. So the complement of nine is one, complement of eight is two. So how far away from 10, how far from the base are they? And watch what we do to get nine times eight in this fashion. We multiply the two down fingers, right? This would have been two and one. So that's the multiplication part. And then we cross subtract because these are called deficiencies. So either nine minus two or eight minus one. Both of those give us seven and nine times eight is 72. So this is a way that we can apply some symbolic, the use of symbolic math uh, to do the multiplication as well. So let's jump down to G. Complement of eight is two, negative two if you want, because it's two short of 10. Seven is three short of 10. So we did this one earlier. Multiply the down fingers, two times three is six. Cross subtract, so either seven minus two or eight minus three, and we get five, 56. And it always works. I, I did a lot of these and I kept on trying to figure out why it works. And it has to do with this complementing of 10. And when you work within the culture of a number system, you get these amazing patterns that come out of it. Well, let's see if we can get bigger. So here's numbers above 10. Again, we did this earlier. Uh, it changes a bit because then we're counting the surplus above 10. So 11 is one above, 12 is two above. And just like we did before, we add the down, or we multiply the, the down fingers, we also added them. But, uh, and then what we're gonna do is we're going to cross add because those are above 10. So 12 plus one, which is 13, or 11 plus two, which is also 13. And we get the first part of the answer. So 11 times 12, is 132. Want to get going faster. Let's get to the hundreds now. Um, here we go. We're going to jump to C. 92, it's 8 away from 100. 99 is 1 away from 100. We multiply the down numbers. 1 times 8 is 8. We put 0, 8 because 100 has two zeros, so it's going to need two digits in each of the answers. We then cross subtract. And again, you could either take 99 minus eight or 92 minus one, and you will get the same answer. So this is where you do a little problem solving. Oh, 92 minus one, that's easy. That's 90, 91. Um, I, I was not going to blow it. I was going to say 93 because I added instead of subtracting. So it's not as easy as you think. But the cool part about all of this is when you go back to check your answers, there's a way to check and uh, you, you find out where your errors were, and then you get it on, back on track, okay? 99 minus eight is also 91. Here we go, and, and you can even get one number that's kind of far from 10, or from the base, so 77 is a little far from 10, so we use our all from nine last from 10 to get its complement. 77, the complement is two, three. So the first seven complement is two, the second seven complement is three. Uh, 98, the complement is 0, 2, and we can actually mentally, once you get practice, you know, multiplying by 2, you're doubling. So 23 doubled is 46. You just double both sides. So you learn some techniques that way to actually be able to do um, 
larger ones. But in this case, I definitely want to take 77 minus 2. That's 75. 98 minus 23 is the same, but again, it gets you thinking, directed thought and evaluation, which I evaluate, which one's going to be a little bit easier for me? Which one's going to cause me a little bit more comfort? And that's the key of mathematics. You build knowledge comfortably. Wow, we can go to thousands? Certainly. Once you get the process down, even 682 times 999, most people would feel a little intimidated because that 999, but we now know that that's going to make it very easy because it's one away from a thousand. And one times 318 is a simple thing to do. I love multiplying by one. It was my favorite number to multiply by, 318. And then we cross subtract in the appropriate way. We just look at 682 minus one, there's 681. And check it with your calculator, you'll see that is the correct answer to 682 times 999. A technique that gives us the feeling of power, mathematical power. And it's something we can share with others. It's not power over others, it's power with others. This is the kind of education we need. So what have we learned about math? Well, we learned that the wealthy of American students are the first in the world. Go America. But the great economic gaps that the unwealthiest, those who are struggling economically the most, were not doing so well. So can we make, if we make, not if, when we make a more equitable society, we will have so much power because we will empower those who have a passion for creative design of a world and sharing. The Learn Wisely pedagogy with Vedic's math instruction can be a culturally appropriate approach for indigenous students for every student. Uh, and again, my personal definition as I've come to, because while I've shared one side of my, uh, my background with you, my father, his people came from England. Uh, they were Saxons, uh, the Saxon tribe that was a couple thousand years ago, conquered by the Romans. And then those Saxons, those same people who were conquered by the Romans, have gone out and colonized the rest of the world. But before they did all that, they were very indigenous people. They lived within clans, within tribes. They followed nature. And when we follow nature, that's to me, it's how our heart and our morality work. That's our morality. That's our following. That's what it means to be indigenous. Indigenous is not something that happens to us at birth. It's something that happens to us along our life journey. And it's something we choose. In this industrial world, it oftentimes becomes a hard choice to make. But we all can choose to be indigenous, connected to the earth and connected to each other. To make learning complete, there's three components. We use acquired knowledge from others. We get those insights and we study them but then we have to make it our own. We contemplate it on by ourselves. We have to think about it. We have to see how it fits within our being. And then we practice. That's our job as teachers, to work with students, to get benefit from the acquired knowledge, to learn how to think about it on their own terms, and to give them the practice to make them proficient We've also learned that math problems enter through the emotional center of the brain. And so all of our teaching has to also address the emotions, the stress, the anxiety that can come about. We have to address that in a way that we make learning math fun and enjoyable and powerful for others. Finger math gets the thinking in the math part of the brain 
that does the math part of the stuff, however you want to say it, using your hands to do math is a powerful director, both physically and cognitively. And then so as we build from that extension from the, um, from the Indian culture of long ago, we're able to do large multiplications in a short period of time. Math power, math power to all. Okay, so I look forward to working with you in this semester, learning to do problem solving on our own. We'll look at math content, yes, but we'll do it in a way that makes it meaningful to you. As I talk and work with teachers, the most important thing for a teacher is they have to love learning, enjoy learning, love people, enjoy being with people. And elementary teachers have the most important job in the world because as students first come into that preschool, that kindergarten, so many times you see them all smiling. But I've worked long enough in education, I see along the way, the smiles disappear more and more and more. Our job is to keep those smiles. So will you work with me this semester, finding a way to change the world through math education, or change math education and change the world at the same time? By how? Bringing joy to each individual we work with. So be well, take care, and it's time for me to take off. So I remember to bring my jacket with me. Oftentimes I leave it sitting behind, but be well and take care. <laughs>